How about that? How about that, Clint? And he said, there shall be sound. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, I'm teaching on the subject today of miracles. Don't hear a lot about that in the Baptist church, do we? The, the pro or con, we just don't hear much about miracles. But I thought today I would address this limitedly. In 1 Corinthians 12, reading from verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning spirits, to another different kinds of languages, to another the interpretation of languages. When I was a, a young Christian, I was bombarded like so many of us were by individuals telling me that they had been healed by God, that God had done some great miracle in their life. And I really wanted to find some answers for myself about this subject. We have been accused of being a limited gospel preaching people. Simply because there is a movement called full gospel, therefore we are, if we're not part of full gospel, we are less than full. And, and I wanted to find out, is that really true? Are we less than full gospel? Well, after a lot of years, thank God, a lot of hard knocks and study, I really can think we are not less than full gospel in our teaching and understanding. And when I was in seminary, I've, I've shared this with others before, that I was fortunate enough, one of our professors at this time, uh, Brother Dr. Hoyt Chastain, was a, a marvelous Bible teacher. Uh, he, was, he could quote, I believe, uh, the first chapter of Genesis. I mean, he had a wonderful mind in the Hebrew language and uh, just a marvelous teacher. And I was working in restaurants. I was a cook in those days. And there was one particular lady. Her name was Ruby. I don't remember her last name. Her husband was the pastor of the Pentecostal Church of God uh, in the local area down south where I was working. And she was a sweet lady, and her, she and I had some wonderful Bible study times as we could working there in the restroom. And I know she would teach me some things that I didn't quite believe and really didn't have the answer to, being a first-year seminarian, and I would have the privilege of going to uh, school the following day and talk to Dr. Chastain or one of the other numerous uh, instructors that we were blessed to be able to sit under. And he would tell me, now listen, you read this verse of scripture here, you look at here, and this is, you know, and he'd give me some ammunition, and I'd go back the next day and I'd give her some ammunition, or I'd give her some, unload on her what he had given me. And boy, we went back and forth for that for months and months, and then I'd stumble her and she'd have to go home and talk to her husband, who was the pastor. And she'd have to get back some, you know, we'd come back and we fussed. But in so doing, I was able to learn a little bit better and have a little better understanding about this subject of miracles. That was in the day of Catherine Kuhlman. Some of you remember her. Uh, I mean, I give you a lot of personal stories, but this was in those days. But I think, really, one of the conclusions that I have drawn over the years, it's one of the one of the most dangerous heresies in our religious society today is the spiritualistic philosophy of miracles. But before you jump to conclusions and say, oh boy, here comes the Baptist interpretation, I want you to hear me out first of all. I think today that people are being led astray by the multitude of embezzling artists who people are flocking to 
and these embezzling artists are getting rich by the millions under the guise of miracles and their healings. They're standing in line to get into their campaigns. One of my good friends, he's deceased now, was Dr. Bill Roberts, and uh, Brother Roberts had been into the Pentecostal Church of God, Assembly of God movement for 23 years when he finally came into the Baptist work, and he wrote a book just before his death, but he was able to tell me about some of the things that he experienced in that movement. And one of the things was he was involved when A.A. A. Allen, did anybody remember the name A.A. A. Allen? Some of us old people do. A.A. A. Allen had his camp in Miracle Springs somewhere in Arizona, and he was one that claimed uh, that he could raise the dead. He had great tent meetings all over California, and Brother Roberts was part of one of those crusades. And he said, but when those crusades left and those people that were healed, we were left to contend with. We were left to bury some of them. We were left to minister to many of them. It was like a lady that I worked with many, many years ago, one of my first jobs in restaurants. She went to one of the local crusades for a guy named... Uh, Oh, I can't even remember the name of his guy. He, he was, came through and did this miracle crusade. And she went and she was healed of her gallstones. And three months later, she was in the hospital having them removed. And these things really bothered me. When I would see people who were poor and did not have a, a lot of financial resources were going to these meetings. People who were desperate for the hand of God to come upon them desperate for a healing that the medical society hadn't provided uh, the means for them to find the comfort they needed. And they would go and they would give until it hurt. They would take their social security checks and give to these charlatans. One of them that came through our area in Bakersfield had made the statement that in three years he had made over three million dollars in this campaign. And something just didn't hit a good chord about that. When we come to the subject of miracles in the Bible, there are three main words in the Greek that, that give us the understanding about miracles. The first one is the word samian. Samian is a miracle of authentication, of divine mission of the person who's doing the working. It's translated in the Bible, sign. John 20 30 and 31, you will read where the word Simeon is used, signs. Then the second word is the Greek word terra. And terra is a miracle that's translated by wonder, uh, by Webster as a wonder. And it's any development out of the ordinary course of nature, and so extraordinary as to excite wonder and amazement. That's the word terra. And then we find the Greek word dunamis. We're all familiar with that because that's where we get our word for dynamite. But we often misunderstand and think that, that dynamite really is the Bible word. Well, really the Bible makes we get our English word because our dynamite is no power at all compared to the, the dunamis or the wonder-powerful working hand of God. And Deutimus is the, the miracle demonstrating divine power, supernatural power or ability, as in this text in Corinthian tells us. You'll find all three of these Greek words used in Acts 2 and verse 22, where he says, You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by the miracles, dunamis, and by the wonders, terra, and by signs, samion, which God did by him in the midst of you, and you yourselves also know this. What is a miracle? What constitutes that? We hear a lot of people use that word in our day and time very loosely. What is a miracle? A miracle is an interruption 
It's an intervention in the system of nature as we know it today. It's a temporary suspension of the laws that govern this world. It is a miracle, it is a supernatural. Now the word supernatural means simply above the natural. An example of this kind of miracle is found throughout the Bible. We read of the money miracles of Jesus, but we see the miracles at the virgin birth of Christ. When the sovereign act of God suspended the laws of nature, we find uh, that some people use this word like, oh, isn't that sunset a miracle? Isn't that cloud formation just a miracle? We use that word commonly. Or that little beautiful child, that's just a miracle. Childbirth is a miracle. These are the times we use it. But really, this is not the, the use of the word miracle as found in the Bible. When we look at the Bible example of miracles and we see that uh, uh, dust was turned into insects, as Moses was able to do, that's a miracle. When we see the sweeping of a mantle across a stream and the waters held back, that's a miracle. When we see a blind man, blind from, from birth, healed, person lame from birth, healed, those are wonderful miracles that we read in the Bible. When we see water turned into wine as Jesus did at the marriage at Cana, that's a miracle, friends. That's a true miracle. That's something they could see with their eyes. There was no question in them about what kind of a miracle there was. Well, miracles were given then as a gift. In Bible times, they were a gift of miracles. And let me say something, friends. These miracles were not a gift for show. They were not for entertainment. They weren't given just for the spectacular sense of the onlooker. I've heard this term used, they weren't given in a circus maximus to uh, draw the attention of the one that was performing the miracles. The miracle workers in the Bible didn't go around pitching tents and advertising in the local newspaper and have a line of people coming that needed heal and screen those people as the modern faith healer does today. Screen them. Oh, if you've got 80% hearing, 20% in this ear, and 80 in this one, let that person through. And when we scream in your ear to be healed, oh, boy, they'll, I've been healed under the emotion of the moment. They get healed. Never done in that spectacular of a moment. You remember in the scripture, the second temptation of our Lord, when the Satan attempt, uh, attempted the Lord to, to cast himself down from the pinnacle of the temple in order to receive lavish applause by the people. Jesus refused to do it. And Jesus was asked by the Jews to perform some sign. He, he only refused to accommodate their empty curiosity with anything other than by their hard hearts. And now the same with, with Herod Antipas. Herod was happy to receive Jesus when he heard about him. I've heard about this guy doing all these miracles. Yeah, bring him in. Let's see if he'll do a miracle. I want to see this trick that he performs. And Jesus refused to do a miracle a cheap trick for this monarch's entertainment. They were never given for show and for the spectacular. Well, what about miracles? Are they, what, what are they for? Well, miracles are given to win the lost to Christ. There are those that believe that, that that's what miracles are for. I'll tell you what, if that's what they're for, God missed the mark in our day and time because he must not want them saved very badly, because we don't see the miracles being performed as they did in the New Testament time. When Jesus turned a few loaves 
uh, of, of bread and fish into enough food, folks, to feed over 5,000, Jesus said this about that miracle in John 6. Jesus said, I truly say to you that you are following me and you are seeking me not because of the miracles, but because of you ate of the loaves and fishes and you were filled up. Jesus said, the only reason you're following me is because of your vain appetite, because you got something to eat. Quit feeding you and you'll be gone in a heartbeat. It wasn't bringing them to an understanding of Jesus. You remember another story in the Bible where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Why, you would have thought, man, what a revival is going to break out. Jesus, he didn't just raise somebody from the dead. He raised somebody from the dead, had been stinking for a few days. And he purposely didn't come there in time to, to save him and heal him. He waited till he was dead. And when he came and raised Lazarus from the dead, and my, one of the greatest joys that I read in the Bible is about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. You would have thought everybody in that community, and for communities near and far, would have been giving it all up and seeking out this man named Jesus and following him. But it wasn't the case. Jesus had done this great miracle of raising Lazarus. The first thing that happened is they were seeking a way to kill him, silence him. And I think the fruitlessness of conversion by miracles is dramatically emphasized by Jesus himself in the teachings of Luke, the 16th chapter, and the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and you're familiar with that, that, that uh, Lazarus, the rich man, a rich man died and Lazarus died, and, and you remember Lazarus had to go to the table just to beg crumbs that fell from his table. And the rich man fared sumptuously, the Bible says. And he died, and the Bible says the rich man went to hell. He didn't go to hell because he was rich. He just misprioritized his life. And then we find Lazarus also died. And the Bible says that he went into the bosom of Abraham, which is a symbolic teaching of into heaven itself. And the rich man sees Abraham, and he Makes a, to make a short story long, he, he says, wouldn't you, you know, this place is terrible. Terrible. Would you go back and send somebody back and have them preach to my five brothers? Because uh, if somebody goes back and preaches to them, they'll have a chance to learn about this place. They won't come here. And Abraham said, no. He said, well, send somebody back from the dead because if somebody comes back from the dead and preaches them, then they will believe. And Abraham says, no. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, what he was saying to them, they have the word of God. If people aren't going to believe the word of God, it doesn't matter whether somebody comes back from the dead. They're not going to buy into it. Fruitlessness. Miracles don't bring conversion, even at the astonishment of one being raised from the dead. Why? Because we, the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace through faith, not of miracles. It wasn't a miracle that saved me. It was a believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and him coming into my life. Then what's the purpose of miracles if that's not what they were for? Miracles are for introduction. They're for authentication, for substantiation. At the beginning of each dispensation, God uses miracles, and that's how he introduces those new dispensations of time. Their creation story is one filled with many miracles of God. The introduction of the, the law by Moses, the Mosaic period of time, was through the many miracles that were done. 
the revival under Elijah and Elisha in the days of great apostasy. Well, it seemed like true worshipers of God would die from the face of the earth was filled with miracles going on at that time. The introduction of Jesus as our Savior into our world came and was filled with miracles. But during the age known as the Great Tribulation, Pastor David taught on this last year, in the book of Revelation, filled with many great miracles. That's the tribulation, period. I don't want to be around to see them miracles. That's the one miracle I don't want anything to do with. But you see, the, the gift of miracles and our miracle-working God are two different things. Okay? You might say to me, Pastor Lauren, to take it sounds, sounds like you're saying you don't really believe in miracles. Yeah, I do. I really do. I could read about them all day long in the Bible. I can read what Jesus did. And let me tell you, they still thrill me. When I watch Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments and his poor cinematography as there was in that day compared to today, that movie still thrills me. When I see Moses uh, turning that water of the Nile River into blood, when we see the mighty, miraculous hand of God, that still thrills me to this very day. So the purpose of a miracle is for authentication, for substantiation. In Mark, the 16th chapter, I'd like for you to turn there, because I think this is a good scripture. It's Mark 16, the last chapter of the book of Mark. Mark 16. Verse 17, Jesus said, And these signs, Simon, will follow those who believe. I'm a believer. Jesus said this. Those signs will, will follow those who believe. Jesus, without question, said, In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new Tongues, and I always interpret that the way the Bible means it, languages. We can talk about that at another time. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will no means hurt them. If they take a can of Drano and drink it, it ain't going to bother them. They can be like some of the churches in the Mid-South that take up snakes, snake handlers. Some of them do die, let me say that. Uh, and you ask them what happened. Well, they picked up the snake and dropped their faith at the same time. That's what happened. So what Jesus said, in my name, this is what you'll do. Jesus said, in my name, you'll take these old deadly snakes, you'll drink anything you want, it will not hurt you. They're going to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There was no question about it. When they laid hands on the sick, Jesus said, they will recover. It wasn't a matter, well, they might if they got enough faith. Jesus says they will recover. No question about it. Well, then we think that we read, we're typical. We, we come to what we want to read and we shut the book and we sit down and go on. There's the promise. We fail to recognize the rule of interpretation. And read verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Miracles were for authentication of the word of God. And there we have it. Why do we not see the miracles? They died out. We don't see them like then. In fact, that's not me saying it. Read your history books, your biblical church history. Read what our forefathers wrote. After the early church uh, fathers died out, they were no more miracles being conducted. That's what history says.
when the purpose of miracles... You see, the early, the early church, the disciples, the apostles, folks, did not have a completed canon of Scripture, okay? When they went out and said, in the name of Jesus, you need to be saved. Well, people would say, but yeah, who is this Jesus? Why should I believe what you're saying? You're just another Johnny come lately. So they had the ability to do miracles to confirm the Word of God. They had the ability to do miracles to confirm they were, in fact, sent by God. That's what delineates them from many of these so-called miracle workers of our day and time. They were sent by God and they had the miracles until that canon of Scripture that we know as the Bible, till it became complete, they were looking through a glass darkly. But then when that canon of Scripture became complete, they could see themselves for what they are, for the Bible became clear to them. And for the infancy days of the church, they didn't have a Bible. So the apostles were, in essence, the Word of God, and they had the power to confirm the Word. That's why they had the miracles. But the gift of miracles and our miracle-working God are two different things, okay? The gift of miracles, I'll contend and stand to it with the Word of God, that the gift of miracles came to an end. But there's a lot of difference between the miracles of God sovereignly, sovereignly performed, okay? The miracles of God sovereignly, what does that mean? That God by His own choosing, if God determines to do a miracle, God will do a miracle. He doesn't need you and I to stand and command and, and run our, our cape across anybody or lay hands or anoint. He doesn't need that. God will sovereignly heal whom He chooses to heal. But that's only one aspect of the miracles of God. God does many other miracles, but He does it sovereignly. So there's a difference of the gift of God sovereignly wrought or sovereignly bestowed. I want you to get that, understand that. God isn't sovereignly bestowing the gift of miracles on anybody, but God still can do miracles. How many times have we prayed for God to do the miracle? Many times. We still will. Should we not? No, we still should. I still pray for the sick. I hope you do too. We never know when God's going to choose to do that miracle. We look in the Bible. We see that case, God sovereignly doing miracles. We see that he went in multitudes. Some were healed. Some were not. In the last chapter of 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul was giving his departing speech. And, and I believe the brother's name was Propius. He said, him I have left in Miletus sick. Paul had the ability to heal. Why didn't he heal Tropius? In the sovereign act of God, God chose not to. His, men, his, young, his young buddy, Ty, uh, Timothy, or Paul's buddy Timothy, he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, you need to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Why didn't Paul just go up and lay hands on him and heal him? He wouldn't need a little wine. By the way, it says a little wine for your stomach's sake. Didn't say a whole lot, a little bit. We find many cases that God sovereignly chose to use a miracle when others were not. Why were some healed and some left not? So God chooses to do miracles when he chooses to do miracles. But the modern miracle worker today does not perform miracles like our Lord did. Nor does he try to perform miracles like the Apostle Paul or Peter did. The modern miracle worker of today has his tents. He has advertisements, draw people to come together. And you don't see the modern miracle worker in the homes of the aged, in the Alzheimer's home, you don't see the modern miracle worker in the ICU of the hospitals. You don't see the modern miracle worker in the mental institutions where people are sick and touching people. But they're 
throwing their banners and saying, come in. And they're making money. And they're gaining wealth. This is not an example our Lord gave us by any means. If our Lord were here today in the miracle business, you would possibly find him in the mental wards. You would find him in the hospitals, the places of the sick, healing those people that needed to be healed. I went to school in the grammar school with a young boy. I was young too, but his name was Dave Gafford. Excuse me, Danny Gafford. Danny and I were in junior high together, and that's where I really got acquainted with him. Danny was a good Christian boy. I wasn't, didn't know much about Christianity. Danny's daddy had been injured in a welding accident where he was welding on something near a, near a, a gas tank, and it blew up in his face, and it blinded him. When I met Dave Gafford, he was working at the post office, selling candy. They had a little booth there, and he sold candy and gum and that type of thing at the post office. And when they built the new Civic Center and the courthouses, Dave Gafford had a stand and a, a, and a booth in there where he sold candy and soda cans at the courthouse. Very well loved and liked. And I remember Danny, his son, talking to me about a, a, a faith healer that was coming and his dad was going to be healed. And I never did hear the outcome of that until I became a grown man and Dave, the blind man's brother, was the deacon that helped lead me to the Lord and told me the story about Dave. He said he went to this Jaggers, who was the evangelist that came to Bakersfield, and they paid back then in those probably late, well, late 50s or early, yeah, late 50s, they paid this evangelist $500 to allow him to come into the healing line. And they brought Dave, blind as blind gets, through the healing line. And as he laid hands on him, healed, be healed in the name of Jesus. It caused such damage to him that some of his his brain was coming out of his nose. They rushed him to, I believe at the time it was the Mayo Clinic in Santa Barbara, where he almost died. The local ministerial society raised up so much in arms over that event that they ran that evangelist out of town. This is the kind of thing that we see so often today. When Jesus healed the blind man, blind Bartimaeus, I wonder how much he charged him. You think about that. Well, I could go on, but we're quite a ways out of time here. Just touch the hem of the garment on the subject of miracles. But I'll tell you why I, I don't need the miracles, because I have the Word of God. To me, that's, that's a miracle that we have this book, the 66 of them, brought down to us today that we can read and see the miracles that God has done to give us this book. I don't need to be healed. I have as much ailments as some of you do. And I'm not looking for that miracle. I was like my good friend Jerry Norton. Jerry was my first Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher, she taught the mixed up adults. It was a big class. And right after I became a Southern Baptist in a class and Jerry came down with cancer and she couldn't come anymore. I was end up being the teacher of that class and the last service that we had on a Wednesday night where Jerry was alive, we conducted it at her house. We went out into the country, she had a big house out there and she was in bed and she couldn't get out of bed. And we gathered around after we sang a little bit of a devotion. We gathered around Jerry's bedside. And she was a sweet Christian lady. And I remember Jerry asked this one thing. She said, church, I love you. And I know you love me. But she said, don't pray for my healing. God hasn't chosen that route for me. She had peace about that. I mean, we could, we could have prayed and let's say that God in his sovereign will decided to heal Jerry. She would just had to die again. That had been double whammy. 
But she said, I have made peace with God so many years ago. I want to go home. And we didn't pray for Jerry's healing, but I thought, my, what faith to say, don't pray for my healing. I'm ready to go. And she was ready to go not because of anything other than what Jesus did for her. And listen, that is a wonderful thing in itself. To me, that's the closest thing to a miracle I'm ever going to experience. And I'll be happy with it because I know that when I as a 21-year-old young man came to Jesus and asked him into my heart to save me from my sins, oh, did he do a number on me. He did a number. He healed the old heart. That old cold stone thing, he began softening it. And I learned as time went on that I could continue to sing the song, He Still working on me, trying to make me what I ought to be. Took him six days to make the earth and the stars and the moon, but he's still working on me. God works. When I see some of your lives, I see that's a great miracle in itself. That's the hand of God. Why do we as Christians and the believers in the Word of God need to see some cheap performance of some trick We don't. We've experienced the hand of God. What more can you and I want? Oh, listen, I don't think there is. Pastor, you come, and let's sing a verse, or not sing a verse, uh, Amy will play a verse, and I'm going to ask Pastor if he'd lead us in in our our closing moments. Uh, Again, I believe God is a miracle-working God. And I don't doubt there's people that have experienced a miracle from God. And I'll tell you what, nothing pleases me more to know that that has happened. To know that how many times have you and I been sick that maybe it was nigh unto the point of death. Maybe we didn't even know that God had touched our lives. That he did. He took care of us. But the bottom line is he's taking care of me when the last breath comes. That's what I'm counting on not a miracle in between.